This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Fables 2, Pirates of the Ethereal Expanse. This second installment in the Fables franchise has you set sail into a magical ocean, taking up your pirate-themed campaign and going out on great adventures in this mystical, magical, almost space-like ocean. We were super excited by the trailer, and you should definitely check it out uh, in the links below, because Pirates of the Ethereal Sea is an amazing blend of high piracy and high magic. I have tried to run several pirate-themed campaigns. I'm a big fan of them, and I gotta say the inspiration here is top-notch. I was really, really excited just watching the trailer and can't wait to see what's in store in these next upcoming chapters. Each fable is broken into six chapters, and you get a new adventure every month to download. They come with everything that you need to run it, including digital maps and tokens and tools. So whether you're playing in person or online, it's a perfect way to have a new campaign to play every six months. And this new Fables adventure is coming on July 1st, so it's not even that far away. So check the links below, watch the trailer. This is definitely one to keep your eyes on. Thanks so much to Fables 2 and Ghostfire Games for sponsoring this episode. Things like this help us do what we do here on YouTube. And now on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we're going to charge up our power level and upcast some of our spells. Many spells in Dungeons & Dragons allow you to expend a higher level spell slot to cast a lower level spell. And when you do so, there are additional properties or bonuses that these spells gain. Today we're going to look at a number of spells that are great for upcasting. We've broken these spells into different categories and we're going to talk about our top 10, but there are going to be a lot of honorable mentions because there are actually some great groups of spells that might really benefit from upcasting. Many evokers and pyromancers will reach for spells like Fireball when they're thinking of spells to upcast, but Fireball is actually a really great example of a spell that does not scale nearly as well as the spells that we're going to be talking about in this episode. Fireball, when you cast it at 3rd level, does 8d6 points of damage, but if you upcast it to 5th level, 2 spell slots higher, it goes to 10d6 points of damage, which is really only a 25% increase in the spell's overall effectiveness. There are some spells out there that we're going to talk about today that double their effectiveness when you upcast them. Or if you upcast them high enough, gain new properties and options that really change what the spell can do. So we're gonna talk about our top 10 spells and a bunch of honorable mentions. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So one of the first spells that whipped our minds into thinking about the notion of upcasting is actually Tasha's Mind Whip. This was a new spell that was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that allows you to target a single enemy to do psychic damage to them, and if they fail their saving throw, they're also only able to take an action, bonus action, or movement on their turn, not all three. It's only a second level spell, but when you upcast it, for every level you upcast it, you get to target an additional creature with this spell. So this means that when Tasha's Mind With becomes a third level spell, you get two targets, doubling the number of targets you get to hit with this. And as you upcast it even further, if you go as far as a fourth level spell slot, you get four targets with this spell. While the damage doesn't increase, the expansion of the control effect can be really, really potent in shutting down a whole encounter on its own. And I think for something like a control spell, we're not really looking at how much damage it does. I think that the fact that you can impact multiple targets with it is game changing. And once you're a high level spellcaster with multiple higher level spells, being able to disable three, four, five targets in a single turn with a single spell can be well worth it. So Tasha's Mind Whip can really upscale well. But there are a number of spells that are similar to this that also, as you upcast them, allow you to choose more targets. Clerics, of course, have the amazing spell Command, which is only a first level spell slot. And again, you could command four or five creatures to grovel before you, which is great for only a fifth level spell slot. But maybe you don't want to have such a commanding presence and would rather charm a group of monsters or people because both charm person and charm monster upcast like this as well, allowing you to lay that smooth talking down to a group of people at once, which can be very handy in many social situations. Sometimes monsters and people don't want to be charmed, they just want to be held. And hold monster and hold person are also on this list. 
And I think that it is great to be able to upcast those to target multiple people. But also, every once in a while, you don't want to hold a monster or charm a monster. You just want to get rid of a monster. And Banishment is on this list as well as another spell that you can target multiple monsters with as you upcast it. Finally, Bane is a great first level spell that initially targets three creatures, but upcasting it does give you additional targets. And if you're looking for more level, low, uh, more low level ways to shoo away your foes, you can also upcast Cause Fear too. I really like spells like Command, Cause Fear, and Tasha's Mind Whip for upcasting, particularly when characters reach about 10th or 11th level, because oftentimes at these higher levels of play, you're going to be using your higher level spell slots to concentrate on a very, very powerful spell. And in the midst of those kind of encounters, you're kind of left wondering, what am I going to do with my 5th level spell slots if I'm already concentrating on a 5th level spell? By upcasting these lower level spells using your higher level spell slots, it lets you leverage the power of your higher level spell slots, which often the most powerful ones require your concentration, and Tasha's Mind Whip in Command don't. So although Tasha's Mind Whip might be our favorite, up on screen right now is our list of all of our offensive debuff spells that we think are iconic selections for upcasting in your games of D&D. As we move on to the next category, instead of offensively debuffing your targets, sometimes you want to buff you and your allies. And there's a number of spells that similarly allow you to target more creatures as you increase the level of spell slot you use. Probably one of the most notable examples of this is the spell Fly. Fly is a third level spell that allows you or whoever you cast it on to gain a flying speed. Very helpful for solving many different situations or just getting into a better vantage point within a combat encounter. However, you can simply upcast Fly and allow your whole party to gain a flying speed. This is even better at solving problems. You need to get over the castle walls or cross a dangerous canyon or something of that sort. Well, if you just upcast Fly to a high enough level to handle all of your party, you're good to go. If you have several characters in your party that are capable of making effective ranged attacks, simply casting Fly on your entire party and taking it to the air in combat can sometimes be one of the best ways to shut down high level combat encounters in a way that you couldn't otherwise do with many other fifth level spell slots because having that aerial advantage is such an amazing combination of both offense and defense. If you want to go even further with this, you can even pair it with invisibility if you've got another spellcaster in your party, because invisibility, unlike greater invisibility, also works under this upcasting mechanic. Invisibility, when cast using a fifth level spell slot, will affect four targets. That's your entire party. And so if you're in that stealth mission situation and you're worried about the paladin getting through, well, you could just upcast invisibility on the whole party. Hopefully the ranger brought pa pass without trace, and now you are not worried about your clunky par party members trudging forward in plate mail because they're invisible under the effects of pass without trace, and they're definitely getting where they need to go. Paladins and clerics also come packing Bless. It's one of their most iconic spells, and Bless stays relevant for most of the game, thanks to the fact that it can also be upcast to include more targets. Now, mind you, once you kind of reach the level where you're blessing your entire party, you don't really need to go much higher than that. But at early level play, I find that it's always tough if you have a group of players that can benefit from Bless and you gotta pick just three. There's always that question at the table, uh, who wants to be blessed for this combat encounter? Well, once you can upcast it, you don't need to worry about that. Yeah, if you have four players in your party, it's often worthwhile to simply just cast Bless with that second level spell slot so everybody can be affected by it. And that way you all get the benefits of it and don't have to choose. If you've got a larger party of five or six players, maybe you might want to reconsider, but hopefully at that point you might have two people in the party that can cast Bless. Some other great spells that work under the same mechanic that buff your party and allow you to upcast them really well are things like Heroism, Longstrider, and Enhanceability. All great and iconic choices for upcasting. Enhance ability can be really clutch in skill challenge type situations where some party members might have to be making skill checks in abilities that they are not good at. For example, if you have a couple party members that have dumped their strength scores, which is pretty common, or their intelligence scores, or their wisdom or charisma, and you're in one of those situations where they are going to do a physical challenge or maybe a social challenge, Casting Enhance Ability on the weaker members of your party and upcasting it so they can all be affected is a great way to close your gaps. Up on screen right now is our full list of all of the buff spells that we think are great for upcasting. Fly is one of the most iconic choices, but there are a number of spells on here that are worth considering for upcasting in your games. So now we come to damage dealing, and this is always going to be a controversial thing because 
Obviously, it's worth upcasting any damage dealing spell if it means you're going to defeat your enemies by doing so, especially if it's going to defeat them one round sooner. If that extra 2d6 damage on your fireball was the difference between wiping out all those goblins and having a bunch of angry orcs charging you on your next turn, that was absolutely worth it. But it's very situational and might not necessarily be your go-to strategy. On the other hand, there are certain spells though that really gain a lot when you upcast them because they're concentration-based spells where you're going to be able to take advantage of the fact that you upcast that spell every round. And I think the poster child for this is Spirit Guardians. Spirit Guardians deals damage when a creature enters your range or if they start their turn there. What's great about Spirit Guardians is it's often used on clerics who sometimes have heavy armor and can stand on the front lines drawing enemies in towards them. When they do so this means that enemies are going to be dealing with Spirit Guardians and sometimes often stuck in that area trying to get their hits in and getting damaged by it. For every level that you upcast Spirit Guardians you gain an additional d8 damage and this piles on turn over turn over turn and this can equal out to a large amount of damage over a short period of time. Druids are not to be outdone in this matter though because Moonbeam and Call Lightning both scale amazingly well and in particular because these spells are second and third level they really get a lot when you upcast them to a fourth or fifth level slot in some cases competing with spells like Wall of Fire and Cloud Kill which are already in those spots. Cloud Kill I think is a great example because I love the Cloud Kill spell but it does do poison damage which is often often resisted and so having a radiant damage dealing spell or a lightning damage dealing spell that is potentially dealing more damage for the same slot level and is some in many ways i think moonbeam call lightning and spirit guardians are way more controllable and movable than wall of fire and cloud kill are although i still love those spells <laughs> this next spell gets a category all to itself and that spell is aid Aid always lets you target three creatures, but what changes when you upcast it is how much you increase the target's hit point maximum. At low levels, aid might not seem like a lot of hit points. As you upcast aid, you can add 20 or 30 hit points to a number of characters on the battlefield to set out for their day of adventure. When you pair this with the fact that aid increases a hit point maximum instead of adding temporary hit points, and you look at spells like Hero's Feast or a feat like Inspiring Leader, you can buff your party to massive amounts, giving them almost double their hit points for the day. In my opinion, it's always worth it to cast aid up to a fifth level spell slot, which is gonna increase the character's hit point maximum by 20 for each of the people that you target. I would hesitate to take it beyond that, but I think it, it's absolutely wor worth it there. Speaking of increasing hit points and interesting spells that ups cast in this way, I wanna give a really cool mention here to Armor of Agathus. Because this is a spell that often I think we've overlooked on this channel, and it is really cool when we start talking about upcasting. On paper, it looks a lot like aid in that when you cast it as a first level spell, you get five temporary hit points, which what is five temporary that's like a that's getting stabbed with a dagger. What is that gonna do? But one well you have those temporary hit points, anytime you're hit with an attack, the, the attacker takes five cold damage. But when you upcast it, the temporary hit points you get and the damage that you cause to an attacker increase by five each time. Thus, if you cast the spell with a fifth level spell slot, because you're a warlock or a conquest paladin, you get 25 temporary hit points, and anyone that hits you with an attack while you have those temporary hit points is gonna take 25 cold damage. Monty and I have often written this spell off in the past because at first level, it seems silly. You really only get to dish out five damage once, and then your temporary hit points are gone. But when you can increase those temporary hit points to 25, that means that you're probably going to be able to withstand two, three, maybe even four attacks, depending on the type of creature you're fighting. I think that if you're a higher level character going into a minion-based combat encounter, being able to drop this on yourself so that if any minion attacks you, they might do 5-10 damage, but then they're going to receive 25 damage, which is going to kill a lot of different minions. It really turns you into a death trap to attack on the battlefield, and I think that's when this spell becomes iconic. At 25 temporary hit points for a 5th level spell slot, 
even higher level enemies, often their attacks kind of start to cap out in the 20 damage range. There's a few monsters that do a lot more, more than this, but you're still within this threshold point where even at higher levels, you're very likely to be able to soak two, maybe even three attacks, which is going to turn around into 50 or 75 points of damage, which is a lot of damage for a fifth level spell slot especially considering that the temporary hit points shielded you from that incoming damage at the same time. Another spell that is iconic for upcasting, and if you've seen the finale of Season 1 of Critical Role, you know how important this spell can be, and that's Counterspell. When you upcast Counterspell, it defeats any spell of a level lower than it. So Counterspell can be a game-changing moment in any campaign where the big bad evil guy is about to drop the deadliest spell on you. And if you upcast counterspell to a 6th, 7th, 8th, or ninth level spell to undo the big move of the final boss, you may have just won the game for you and your allies. And really at any level of play, rather than rolling the dice and chancing counterspell not working, simply upcasting it to ensure that it works and saving yourself that dice roll can be the game-changing moment. There are many ways to improve your odds if you are going to take the gamble with Counterspell or its cousin, Dispel Magic. But in a desperate situation or a climatic moment, sometimes it's not worth taking the risk and rolling those dice. Just go with the upcast and get the surefire thing. One spell that actually greatly increases from upcasting in ways that not a lot of people realize when they look at the spell is Bestow Curse. Bestow Curse has a number of different options that you can bestow upon a creature that you touch and cast the spell on. This spell requires concentration, has debilitating effects, generally a pretty good spell. But as you upcast it, multiple things start to happen. First of all, as you upcast Bestow Curse, the duration of the spell increases, all the way up to the fact that if you cast Bestow Curse as a ninth level spell, it lasts indefinitely. On top of this, if you upcast it to a 5th level spell slot or higher, it no longer requires concentration. This means that if you use a 5th level spell slot to cast Bestow Curse, not only does it no longer require concentration, but that creature is cursed for 8 hours. The higher the level spell slot, no concentration, and you can make it last forever if you want. Of course, the spell can still be removed with Remove Curse, but with the ninth level spell slot, that's the only way to get rid of it once it's been laying down. And I think one of the cool things with this is that you could technically lay multiple curses on the same target because now you don't have to concentrate on them. And yeah. these effects are really tasty when you start realizing, oh, I don't have to concentrate on this. And they could last for a really long time. Like, I could imagine being in a long-term campaign where you have a persistent villain or a recurring NPC. Uh, and either using this as a dungeon master or using this as a player against such a character uh, to keep that curse rolling. <laughs> I also think that the combinations that become open when you no longer need to concentrate on bestow curse and that way you can drop the debilitating effect of giving them disadvantage on a certain saving throw yeah. and then drop an AoE spell that you also concentrate mm -hmm. on. And now you're cooking with gas with being able to combine this with other yeah. concentration spells. Or not. Imagine just bestowing curse on a target to debuff their constitution saving throws when you have a party with a monk and stunning strike. There's just sim simple things like that. Like if your party members have a go-to ability that they're really good at, you bestowing curse on someone so that you can keep them trapped in a grapple or keep them trapped inside... Uh, or keep them even trapped inside something like a web spell or a Bigby's hand. Just make it really hard for them to break out of something. There's one other spell in the entire game that loses its concentration requirement when you upcast it, and that is Major Image. Normally, this third level spell requires your concentration to create a very advanced illusion effect, but if you cast it with a sixth level spell slot, it doesn't require your concentration, and it lasts until it's dispelled. So it's just a permanent illusion that you create, cast it, leave it, forget about it. What's great about this is I think that this is a very important note for both players and dungeon masters. As long as your big bad evil guy has six level spell slots, they can just go around every day creating major images that will last indefinitely around their dungeon or sanctum or lair so that when the player characters arrive, there could be hundreds of major images in effect. It could be full of illusions. Mm. And this is kind of the ticket for DMs to say, hey, you want a bunch of illusions in your crazy dungeon? Well, just give the bad guy major image. 
As for players, if they have time to set up and prep a battlefield or plan their ambush or attack, being able to cast a few major images that just stay put could have some really cool implications. One of my favorite ways to use this is to combine it with Leoman's Tiny Hut. Because Leoman's Tiny Hut will protect you while you're resting, but it's still this glowing dome. Well, if you have a six level spell slot available and you kind of want to set up a permanent base, let's say that you're exploring a dungeon that's going to take you a couple days and you're worried about your camping rated, just make an illusion of a hill over your base or cover over like a cave entrance with an illusion that it just fits in with the cliff face. This is my favorite use for major image. In fact, is modifying the environment to like include an illusory wall that's just permanently there in place. And of course, one of the this is one of those examples of security through obscurity because if nobody knows that three meters up that wall is actually an, an illusion, it's really hard to like look for it if you don't know what to look for. But if you know that it's there, it's really easy to find. So I also like the idea of using this to prepare maybe before like a siege or an attack. Like for example, you could make an illusion around a village of like guard towers or uh, siege weapons um, before the battle to maybe intimidate your enemies and make it look like your forces are larger than they actually are. So maybe they run away. You don't have to concentrate on that. It's just an illusion that's going to stay there. Lastly, we come to another group of spells that are amazing for upcasting. You may want to talk to your DM about the use of these spells. They have been known to be mildly problematic in some campaigns and at some tables. And this is the abundance of summoning spells, but mostly conjure animals. Conjure Animals allows you to summon a group of animals to fight on your behalf, become meat shields on the battlefield. But the more you upcast this spell, the more animals you get. The main problem with these spells, not only do they add a lot of extra hit points and make the battle a lot uh, trickier to navigate for DMs who are trying to challenge their parties, but also they add a lot of weight and clunkiness to the initiative count, to people's turn orders, to how long the druid is taking to take their turn because they have 40 little animals to use every single turn. So be careful with these, although I think all summoning spells are great. We did a high level one shot with our friend Chris over at Treant Monk's Temple. You can check that out right up over here, where he played a druid that, a shepherd druid that used conjure animals and he upcast the spell to cat, uh, summon hordes of velociraptors and hordes of giant owls. Yeah. And they did a lot of damage. Um, and we were playing online and Chris had created macros to do the dice rolling for all the creatures because I think he was summoning like 32 monsters at a time. And that was just a lot to track. He was very, very, very fast. And so in the hands of a player who is prepared with macros and all these, these things and you're playing digitally, maybe you can get away with it. But I don't have 32 Velociraptor miniatures and rolling dice physically to calculate the attacks of 32 uh, Velociraptors attacking with pack tactics. Oof. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Uh, so that might be one of those interactions that you just, everyone just says at your table, we are not going to use that in our game. <laughs> Now we also have Conjure Woodland Beings or even Animate Objects kind of yeah. falls into this category as well. These are all incredible spells, but just be aware of what you're adding to the game when you use them. But I think it should be noted that many of the summoning spells that were added in Tasha's, which are a little bit more simple and easy to run at the table, still scale really well with an upcast. And many of these creatures gain more hit points and can make more attacks or sometimes even deal more damage based on the level of spell slot that you're using. So those are kind of your easy ticket into mm. summoning spells. But if you are going to be using Conjure Animals, Conjure Woodland Beings, or Animate Objects, have some math skills ready. Now, speaking of summoning creatures, there's one other spell that's similar, but kind of deserves its own mention here, and that is Planar Binding. Now, if you're using Planar Binding, you might need to also have Magic Circle to trap the creature in front of you so that you can cast Planar Binding. But there are some benefits to upcasting Planar Binding. Planar Binding allows you to take an extra planar creature like an elemental, a fey, or even a fiend and bind them into your service for a 
prescribed length of time. You have to expend an expensive material component to cast the spell, but when you upcast Planar Binding, you are able to bind that creature for longer periods of time, taking the regular duration of the spell up to days, weeks, months, and eventually even years. Um, we have seen this spell used in long-term campaigns for druids and wizards to build armies of elementals at their command by using spells like Conjure Elemental alongside Magic Circle and working together to summon monsters into the Magic Circle, hold them there, and then bind them into their service. It's really cool if you're kind of doing more of those that world-building, long-term sort of campaign. And it's an, another one of those rare examples of upcasted spells that get an increased duration that kind of have this like long-term effect on the campaign. Another notable mention that works similarly when upcast is Mass Suggestion. Mass Suggestion already, um, Mass Suggestion already, um, Mass Suggestion allows you to take a group of people, give them a command, and they're going to follow it out. But you can make them do it for a very, very long time if you upcast it. So if a group of guards are giving you trouble, you can have them stop and count sand on the road or just dance in place for hours and hours or days or even upwards of a year. And dancing for a year is going to be actually really harmful when you think <laughs> about it. Uh, at first it sounds fun, but the party never stops. So that is our list of some of our favorite spells to use in D&D 5e that are worth upcasting. We think that these spells offer much more unique and interesting effects when, when you upcast them that are a little that might be a little bit more useful to you than just grabbing a fistful of dice when you cast your next fireball. If you've had great experiences casting some of these spells at a higher level spell slot, or if you feel that we missed some of your favorite upcastable spells, tell us about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you want to hop on Discord and tell us why we're wrong or which spells we forgot to mention in this episode, you should join our Patreon community and tell us all about it in our Patreon-only Discord server. And if you want to see me trying to upcast spells and usually forgetting to, you should check out our live play in The Fate of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos where we discuss all the great spells in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. In the dungeon.